Okay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So uh, we'd like to welcome everybody that's joined us from the various parts of the world that have logged in and, and uh, dedicated their time to spend with us. And uh, I'd like to introduce Peter Bosselman. Peter Bosselman is the Chief Mindfulness Officer at SAP. And Peter is joining us today to share some of his wisdom about the journey that he's taken and um, about his own personal practice, as well as the practice and how he leads what uh, is the, uh, the mindfulness program for SAP. And with that, Peter, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Maybe you could share a little bit more thoughts and uh, about yourself. Oh, absolutely. Yes. So again, welcome from, from my side to anybody who is in the call or listening to the recording. And I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. And it's um, for, for us and for me, it's, a, it's an interesting time because we're doing this now since um, about 10 years. So in June 2013, we did the first pilots within SAP, bringing SIY, um, Search and Site Yourself program to SAP. And of course, there was like um, about half a year of work before to get it to get it uh, done. So if anybody of you is in this process here in the company, it takes a little while. And I'm, I, I'm, yeah, I like to reflect on what we learned uh, in this in this conversation, and also uh, some some guidance and maybe some questions from from you will come up that, that I can also that can address I can address. Um, so that's um, yeah, let's make this uh, worthwhile um, remaining time. Yeah, uh, well, so Peter, quite directly, we we would love to know what you have done, the journey that you have taken with your team to scale this program, this really important program that affects people and the, the quality of their lives at work and how you've um, been able to take a journey to scale this across SAP. Let's just start with the big question. Um, how, how, how has the, the, the process of scaling begun to take place for you? Maybe if you could take us down a, a little bit of a journey. Yes, um, you know, before we go there, actually, I want to share a little bit so that people get a sense of what happened uh, in this in this 10 years, maybe I share a few facts to give this to give this a little bit of a, um, um, a base. So, so it has become way bigger than I would have anticipated in the very beginning. And so by now we have trained more than 15,000 so 15000 attendees with an SAP and we also brought this to other organizations and there's also a couple of pe thousand people we train directly and then indirectly this ripple effect we have done um, five teacher trainings within SAP we're just starting our sixth wave I'm very excited about that we have trained in total more than 90 internal teacher um, and we still have about 60 that are active. So that's an impressive number. So some of them doing this now since more than uh, six years. Um, and um, we have a, yeah, we have a huge, we have built a huge community um, that um, is supporting this of teachers and then of ambassadors um, and to really bring this to SAP in a, in a much deeper way than, than I would have anticipated. So SAP, for the ones of you that don't know, is um, as a, a global tech company. It's a leader in business application. Sorry, <laughs> I should know this better. Business enterprise software. Um, and um, yeah, and, and we have brought, um, contributed to a cultural change within SAP. So, so that's it, point one. Yes. Yeah, a 10 year journey, uh, a 10 year journey. And part of that journey has been to enable other people by training them to teach. And in doing so, being able to reach the scale of 15,000 people. I mean, that's, that's an incredible number of people within the SAP workplace that have been enabled with these skills. Yeah, I would love to learn more about that. 15,000, that's such a great number to just repeat. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, yeah, it is impressive. I mean, um, it's, it's as I said, it's way bigger than than I would have believed in the beginning, um, maybe than than I hoped. Um, so I think it's important. So again, if I put myself in the shoes of people that are in the rather in the beginning or somewhere in, in earlier stages of this journey, is is it's um, I think start with one step after the other, but also have a big goal in mind where you want to go, so that you create the the environment in a way. So, so Peter, let me interrupt you. Did, did you have that in mind to actually reach 
the, that number of, you know, a large volume of people, was that really what you had set out to in the beginning or did you grow into maybe that that would be possible? Um, my, okay, that's a, that's a good question, a great question. Um, my very first step was establish a pilot and see. So I have a personal mind from this practice and, and then I grew into this role of becoming more public and, and, and talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and in 15 years or 12 years uh, uh, um, uh, ago, I wouldn't have imagined that I would do this publicly, really. it was uh, So it's my own journey also of growing into, into, into my strengths. And so the very, very first step was establishing a pilot so that we run, we did run two SRI classes to see, am I having just a very special hobby? I love mindfulness and I'm very convinced. Or is it something that really um, has a broader interest at SAP? So that was mm -hmm. the first step. And after the pilots actually had very good results, and this was again 2013 in Palo Alto here in Silicon Valley, where we do a lot of um, pilots within the SAP um, global um, um, organization. Um, then I started thinking, okay, this is flying, or this, there's at least there, there, there's more people than I was um, hoping for. And we also had instantly um, a weightless building. And um, and then I, so in, in my background, I'm, I, I did a lot of large scale programs in, in organizations as a, as a project program manager. And then I started thinking, okay, if I do want to have this big, how do I scale? And then I started thinking, good, good, okay, I need to uh, educate teachers. I can't just do this by myself. SAP has, back then we had more than 80,000 people. Now we have more than 100,000 people. So how can I scale this? And then I um, I started thinking of a business case, how to influence the organization. Yes. So this was in the very beginning, still like one step after the other, and it takes patience and persistence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, yeah. But, but um, having a big goal in mind. That, that helps a lot. It has something that carries you. you so you, if your goal doesn't scare you, uh, and um, then it's maybe too small. You, you said something that's really important, that the, a business case needed to be made. And so generally, when I think of business cases, there, there needs to be justification to get resources from within the company to dedicate toward doing this. Um, you know, to train that many teachers, that's, that's a pretty large... Um, amount of time and resources that are dedicated to to enable this program. So the results of the program must have been quite impressive, or impressive enough at least to build a business case to continue. I mean, ten years later, that's uh, that says a lot in and of itself. Yeah, and it's one step after the other, right? So, so um, if you go back to the beginnings, um, what we did is, I mean, you're right, the, and it's very important to create a business case. In other words create why is mindfulness practices for you specific organization whether it's large like ours or whether it's small why is this important and to make it um, not a cookie cutter approach everybody's doing it we need to do it too but to to become really specific how would it serve our organizational needs and goals so make it a business program and speak business language that's the business case so that you can justify your spending money for the organization that will contribute to the organization's goal. The more you find this language that sounds true to you as the one who's doing it, the champions here in the call, but also the more you find the language where you, your executives, your sponsors say, oh, that would be something we could really need. And it's different, different organizations, of course. Then you, you, have, a, you have a proposal. That's what we change if we bring these practices to the organization. And then you start doing pilots start doing trainings and validate and measure against it and if it goes well and we've seen this in many organizations you validate the business case you see yeah there are certain measures and um, we expected to grow and we could see them grow what was it with an sap um i'm anticipating this question yeah <laughs> um, um so yeah for us we uh, uh, um, one one key measure we looked for is employee engagement Mm. Another key measure we look for is leadership trust. Another one, absenteeism, means like um, are people unexcused, not on, on the job? And uh, so this was back in 2013, 2014. And we could show um, that this actually is improving um, with, with the program in, in, in significant numbers. And um, yeah, I stopped here. Yeah, that's fascinating, Peter. So, you know, the, to really pr bring this together, the business case needs to solve business problems and challenges and needs. And you mentioned goals. So the employee engagement, the leadership trust index, 
and the employee absenteeism were three um, areas that you were able to measure. And, and then the results of that allowed for you to continue and build and grow and build and grow and scale. That's really fascinating. And I'm sure that people that are you know with us today are curious about how do they build their business case to potentially start their program and maybe start off as, as you did with just a pilot. Um, so I think it, it, it bears worth repeating that having something in mind that you want to accomplish as the results of the pilot can show to then build um, more, you know, the business case a little further for more resources and executive sponsorship that um, would be able to lean in and help with the program. Can you talk a little bit about how you influenced others? We all know in these large corporate environments, it's not one person's decision. It's influencing and getting buy-in from others that also have some, some uh, uh, purview over what might take place. Can you share a little bit about how you went about influencing leaders and other people to, to help this program grow and thrive? Yeah, I mean, that's a great and also very wide question. I think it is um, to, uh, the most important is that you, that you listen to leaders. That's one thing I learned over the years. So of course we have an idea of how this could help. And specifically, if you're really fond of mindfulness, um, and you really want to do something, you're really passionate about it, but that you that you still, again, find your grounded presence and see what is it that they need? Where is it that leaders become interested? Where is it like, oh, yeah, nice thing. Um, so so that you see, when, where do I address the organizational needs? Again, for SAP, we are a knowledge-based provide knowledge -based company. So for us, empty engagement is one of the key measures that, that is very high, and it has to be very high. That's that's a very very high strategic goal. For other companies, it can be a worker security, it can be creativity, and of course, uh, mental health is for all organizations in in, in the light of the last the, the um, years um, becoming more important. But you see, what is it? What are problems we are facing? What are things um, that uh, the life of of my executives gets easier? And 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 this is what I would what I would look for. Um, and to your question, how to influence. Um, I mean, you need, I think you need both. You need, you need top level sponsorship and find executives that are open to support. Um, so check this out. Ideally, you have somebody who has a practice. Often I experience there are leaders more and more that have a personal practice that are not very vocal about it. So I would, I would check this out. Try not to break it, break open doors that are closed to speak in this metaphor, but give it a push uh, and then see if the door maybe is opening when you when you talk about it that would be the the the, the top down and then the bottom up um create and this is how we also did it in the beginning um that i can say there were many um, back then 10 years ago mindfulness was less popular than today there were many interested leaders also many many skeptical ones on the other end um, but nobody was confident enough to say, well, I give you the budget to start this because it's quite an amount of money. So I, on the other hand, created a grassroots, created, um, okay, here is something. I made a, made a first um, public event that we invited people from, from such and such yourself um, um, to, to, and in Maine back then, give a public speak and at, at something which we called, or which was happening within SAP, the Innovation Speaker Series. And there, a couple of hundred people showed up. So it showed, oh, there's interest. And then I had a list of people I could address. And again, um, I, um, I, I, I addressed specifically and found out the people that are interested in these programs. And um, within a year, we had a wait list for the program of 1,500 people. That's when my chief learning officer got interested. Like, well, if you have a strong pipeline, it must be a good product. So is there something, and it was mainly by word of mouth, where people are interested in, um, employees are interested in, that can be a big indication that you're doing something that's, that the organization needs. Yeah, you, you shared so much there. And thank you for those you know, nuggets of wisdom. I, the word that came to mind, though, is you helped create a sense of demand by letting people know about what this program could do for them and potentially to help with the business as well and, and momentum and demand for this uh, started to develop. And you use a lot of social and emotional intelligence, it sounds like, your own skills and capabilities to, to lead and influence people um, in, in the direction that could be potentially beneficial for all. I, um, I really appreciate you sharing that with us. And, you know, this is this is really critical because I I'm on the road a fair amount. I'm speaking with executives and speaking with people that have interest in bringing the SIY program or other programs to their organizations to help impact the lives of people. And when I say impact the lives, 
employee engagement is, is an impact. Uh, employee retention is another form of impact. And helping people to develop skills around resilience and being able to better navigate and adapt to the environment that they're in and the change that we, we've all gone through, particularly over the last several years. So th these programs, um, uh, I'm finding to have quite a bit of, uh, of, of uh, interest and curiosity from people. It's creating the link from curiosity to the business case for why a company would wanna spend money to support this program. And I, gr I greatly appreciate you bringing to mind that it's not just from the top down, but from the bottom up, building the grassroots movement, momentum and, and demand that can be uh, delivered to appears to show there is um, there is a need for this. There is a desire for this. Uh, I would also be remiss if I didn't say uh, employee retention is a is top of mind for uh, a lot of uh, executives that I speak to as well, and bringing programs like this to the work environment to help keep people um, in a space that they enjoy. Um, I want I want to throw something in. Actually, I got approval from our chief HR officer many years ago that it's also okay if people go through the program, align themselves, and feel like they want to leave. So we don't want to have anybody who is not happy with their job. It's more the alignment. And out of that, the the um, um, the engagement comes or the decision. Some people decide to leave. But uh, uh, we believe this also supports uh, the organization, just um, to throw this in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that what comes to mind there is the social contract between the employee and the work that they're doing and the, the company they're working for, which brings me to another area of meaning and purpose. Peter, clearly you've spent a fair amount of your life in the work, your work life and your personal life engaged in this. So this I'm going to assume has created some sense of meaning and purpose for you. Do you mind sharing a little bit about your, your personal story? Are there any nuggets of wisdom that you could share around the meaning and purpose? Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, I'm clearly, I, I, I have a lot of energy in, in driving and um, driving this. And I, I wanted to add on the grassroots. I mean, there's something where you um, still need to, in many organizations, to demystify what is mindfulness about. And of course, the root of the SRI program is based on mindfulness and then based on emotional intelligence. And um, to be skillful, to explain why this is important, but also be connected. So for me, uh, I'm a converted skeptic. And um, so about 16 years ago, mindfulness came to my life. Back then, I um, didn't know about it. And um, my partner back then, she had a meditation yoga practice. And I, I thought, like, you can do this. I don't need to do this. I do my triathlon. And then I learned to cut a long story a little short. And this is very powerful. And, and and I created my own practice and I have a deep practice. I sit every day and I go once a year on a 10 day Vipassana. And to me, um, I really believe this and that's important. I believe in the fruits of this practice. I believe in what I experience in my body that there's something shifting that's so powerful and so enriching to life. And I wanna pass this gift on. That's where I, where my why lies. And the more um, you in your journey and, and, and becoming a teacher and becoming a champion, um, connect and reconnect with this. Yeah, this is true to me. And I believe the world needs this. Um, the world will be more connected and hopefully a little more peaceful and, and, and many other benefits and more ethical. If you really believe this, it gives you strength. It gives you strength to, um, to be relaxed when somebody is um, um, challenging you, questioning you, ignoring you. I mean, this. <laughs> speaking of my journey, there's this quote, I think allegedly it's from Gandhi. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. This happens again and again and again and again over the years. So it's, I mean, in a large organization, there's many people you encounter. So the more, and, and for me, it's a gift. And the more I come with a mind, here's a gift I'd like to pass on. And if you're not interested, well, okay, that's fine for me. For me, the gift is still true. This really is very powerful. So that's, that's um, uh, at the root. And then learn how to speak about it, that you address the audience. So uh, I can share in the beginning, I, I, I had contacts from my meditation centers and from my yoga community. And I spoke much more, um, how to say, flowerly, much more um, uh, in a missionary, excited way. And I learned some people, specifically some executives, um, for them, you come, it, it, it doesn't feel safe. They don't want to put their reputation at risk with something that smells like woo-woo, right? Um, yeah. So make it a business program. Again, don't 
be connected with your own spirituality and with your own, uh, how, however you would call it, your own shoes, but learn how to address it that the person on the other hand is really interested um, and, and to find to find a good balance, um, um, not um, that it doesn't feel untruthful to you, but that it feels like that's a skillful way um, to talk about it. Yeah, and I, you know, can see, I, I can talk much longer about it. And so I'm happy that there, it's the other ones um, if you might meet in Lisbon, that there will be more more um, opportunity to to engage. So I just get started here, basically. Yeah, I was just going to say there's so much to share, I'm sure, and there's so much to say. And um, I, I would invite people that are listening, you know, now um, or maybe later through the recording, that we're going to have an opportunity to workshop with Peter in Lisbon in July. We have our annual summit, July 20th through the 22nd. And this will be a time that's very dedicated to help people to workshop how, how might they bring a program? What might that look like? How might they build the business case so that they can show the return on investment that businesses need to see before they invest funds? So Peter is going to be gracious enough to share a lot of the a lot more detail and workshop with us in Lisbon on how other people within their companies, because they have maybe a sense of purpose and meaning to bring this to their organization, um, to, to help them understand how that might be possible. So we're going to have that opportunity here in the, the summer. I highly encourage you to all take a look. Um, my colleague, Sarah, will probably put a link to this event in the, in the chat. And then for, for these last few minutes, I would love to open up and see if there's any questions from people in the audience that they might have for Peter and uh, that I'm sure other people might have as well. So if there are any uh, questions, please feel free to type that into the Q&A box. And while we're waiting to see if, if people do have questions, Peter, um, I, I would love to hear maybe if there were any moments in time, um, maybe within the last few years because of the pandemic and how much change has taken place in business and how much things have evolved. Have there been any moments in time of challenge around the program and just in general with what you've been able to uh, help shepherd and create at SAP. Yes, and, and, and it, it, thank you. Yes, and, and you see me laughing. Um, I think when I started, I had somewhat, um, um, let's call it a romantic illusion that if I only would bring enough mindfulness to the organizational world, life would become easier. And then little by little by little, I realized Life never becomes easier. I mean, I mean, first noble truth: life is dukkha, right? Um, so, so there is, there is life. Life is always happening, uh, or very often happening in a different way than we want. And um, a mindfulness practice strengthens a muscle to meet it with equanimity, with 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 a calm, grounded strength. Oh, what's happening here? Oh, what's happening in my system? Responding to what's happening in the outside. Um, so, so it is a challenging path. Uh, and it's a fun path too to bring um, mindfulness-based emotional intelligence um, to to an organization. It is demystifying. It is change work. It is energetic work, so that you bring in something different, and that you, by doing this, by teaching, by talking to people, attune your skills. Uh, and so I think over the years I, I, I built a variety of um, um, possibilities to see. To whom am I talking and what are they interested in? Sometimes it's most powerful to not talk about mindfulness, but just be yourself and they realize you're somehow different. I get curious. What is this about again? So um, that would be um, a short summary. Yeah, yeah. There's a comment here from Paul Stefan, who's one of our uh, folks over at Autodesk that's uh, now a teacher in training. And he just wanted to say that he, you're an inspiration to him. Um, so I wanted to share that with you and the benefit of having internal teachers and, and do what they do to add value in, in, in your experience. So can you share maybe about what some of the internal teachers have shared with you about taking this journey? Yes, oh, it's, it's, um, I, I'm, it's one of the key success factors of our journey to create this community of multiplier. So it's not just me, we have 60 active teachers that are teaching this. We have another 80 active ambassadors that mm -hmm. are advocates for this. And so any one of them um, expresses, um, I see actually two of them also in the call, hi, I don't say names, um, 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 expresses that this is a personal growth in, in doing this, but it's also the most effective way to change culture. And also um, 
once um, once you have a certain number, it's harder for the executives to, to, to cancel the program because you're more embedded into the culture. That could be also a long-term uh, security mechanism because it, it's, of course, it's unpopular if you have a well-established and well well distributed program with, with many teachers. Um, so um, that was one of my, my strategies, um, um, strategic aspects too. So it is, um, it's one way to really infuse the culture, and then out of that, new programs and more content um, is going uh, is going to be built. It has a, a, a training teachers. There's an um, economic aspect, so it, it, it uh, the business case um, calculates better, but also it's an aspect of knowledge transfer, and um, maybe the most important that you have people from within your organization that talk the organizational language. So it is more convincing if you have an executive talk about. How they apply mindfulness and help them in their day, or or an ex, an expert, or or whatever the role is, as opposed to bring in an external expert, um, where people sometimes might think, yeah, you don't know my reality here. So speaking out of this reality and and, and transferring it to the specific reality um, is very powerful. Last thought for the group of teachers. Then it's also great to have a sounding board. So, you know, is there are challenges that it's not just you, but that you can um, apply the group wisdom, which I do all the time. So I have by now, we have a team of six full-time people that only do mindfulness within SAP, and then this other um, 60 plus volunteer teachers. Um, and we do a lot of the difficult questions in a sounding board manner, where we say, how does it land with you? And it, it's a very powerful approach. Sense of community, you brought that up earlier, and um, having that common experience to share with one another, to learn and challenge each other. So we're we're um, we're at time here, Peter. I just want to say thank you once again on behalf of SIY Global and the audience of people that came here to listen as well. There's so much to share. There's so much more to say. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing people potentially in Lisbon as well, so we can learn and grow together and have a greater impact on the workplace with mindfulness in the workplace and social and emotional intelligence development. Thank you, Alexi. It was, was a pleasure. And I'm it's a true gift for me that I'm able to share this. So anybody who has questions, yes, please come to Lisbon or reach out to SRI Global or to us. Um, and happy to support, to be a further support. Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great day. Take care. <laughs>